Greetings, I am Dr. K. N. Jacob, and today I will be discussing eight sex sins. Eight sex sins. Remember, a sin is rebellion against God. In the Garden of Eden, there was no adultery, there was no fornication, there was no murder, no theft, no covetousness, yet Adam sinned against God. Because he rebelled against God's command, against God's directive. A sin is any rebellion against God. Today, I will be discussing eight sex sins. And the first one is incest. Incest. Now, the Bible says in Leviticus 18.6, Leviticus 18.6, No one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations I am the Lord. No one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. I am the Lord. That's Leviticus 18.6. And who is a close relative? God goes beyond that to define a close relative. And God explains what incest means. He never left anything to chance. So before I go to section number two, I would like to explain some 10 scenarios of incest just from the word of God. Number one, and these are the close relatives and any sexual contact with these people is incest. It is close relatives. It is sex with a close relative. Number one, your mother. You must never have sex with your mother. Leviticus 18.7. Do not dishonor your father by having sexual relations with your mother she is your mother do not have relations with her which also means never have sexual relations with your son this is sin number two stepmother stepmother leviticus 18:8. leviticus 18:8. do not have sexual relations with your father's wife that would dishonor your father Anyone who is married to your father is your stepmother. Do not have any sexual relations with them. That also means for the ladies, do not have any sexual relation with your stepson. Number three, mother-in-law. Mother-in-law. Deuteronomy 27, 23. Deuteronomy 27, 23. Cast is anyone who sleeps with his mother-in-law. Then all the people shall say, Amen. Do not engage in sex with your mother-in-law. Ladies, do not engage in sex with your son-in-law or your sons-in-law. Number four, do not ever have sex with your sister or your stepsister. Leviticus 18.9. Leviticus 18.9. Do not have sexual relations with your sister either your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she was born in the same house or elsewhere. Whether this is your sister in the same house living with you, or this is a girl who was born by your mother or your father and you don't live together. Even if this is a child who came with your mother, you don't share the same mother, but you share the same father. Or you don't share the same father, but you share the same mother. This is your sister. Leviticus 18.11 Do not have sexual relations with the daughter of your father's wife born to your father. She is your sister. Deuteronomy 27.22 A man will be cursed who has sexual relations with his sister, whether she is his father's daughter or his mother's daughter. Then all the people will say, Amen. Now, Incest number five, a close relative number five, is sister-in-law. Sister-in-law. Leviticus 18.18. Leviticus 18.18. Do not take your wife's sister as a rival wife and have sexual relations with her while your wife is living. Here is the deal. You can marry your sister-in-law if your wife passes away. But don't take away her sister, your wife's sister, when your wife is still alive. Why? God protects relationships. He doesn't want blood sisters to be antagonists.
to be quarreling. She doesn't want such close relations to be disturbed because of sexual relations. Because sex is emotional. And if you go to your wife's sister, you are likely never to talk to each other. You are likely to create discord, disharmony in another family. So God prohibits you from sleeping with your wife's sister as long as your wife is alive. If your wife is gone, this is not prohibited to take your sister-in-law as your wife. The Bible does permit and many cultures do permit. Incest number six, granddaughter. Granddaughter. Leviticus 18.10. Leviticus 18.10. Do not have sexual relations with your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter. That will dishonor you. Sleeping with your granddaughter is dishonoring yourself. It's reducing your dignity. It's lowering your dignity. That also means do not sleep with your grandfather. Relations number seven. Incestuous relationship number seven is aunt. Do not ever sleep with your aunt. Leviticus 18, 12 to 14. Do not have sexual relations with your father's sister. She's your father's close relative. Do not have sexual relations with your mother's sister. She's your mother's close relative. Do not, do not dishonor your father's brother by approaching his wife to have sexual relations. She is your aunt. Here is the deal. If you factor in all the relationships described in Leviticus 18, 12 to 14, it means don't ever sleep with your aunt, don't ever sleep with your uncle, don't ever sleep with your nephew, don't ever sleep with your niece. By sleeping, I mean don't have sex with your niece, don't have sex with your nephew, do not have sex with your aunt, do not have sex with your uncle. These are the relationships touched by this passage of scripture. Incestuous act number eight, daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law. Leviticus 18.15, Leviticus 18.15. Do not have sexual relations with your daughter-in-law. She's your son's wife. Do not have relations with her, which means to the ladies, do not sleep with your father-in-law. Don't engage in sex with your father-in-law. Number nine, your brother's wife, your brother's wife. Leviticus 18.16, Leviticus 18.16. Do not have sexual relations with your brother's wife. That will dishonor your brother. For the ladies, it means do not sleep with your brother-in-law. Number 10, and the last one, woman and her daughter a dose of woman and her granddaughter let me start with woman and her grand and her daughter in other words don't ever sleep with a woman and then sleep with her daughter leviticus 18 17 do not have sexual relations with both a woman and her daughter do not have sexual relations with both a woman and her daughter that is wickedness this is a grave sin a great sin very great. Whether it's her daughter or her granddaughter, do not ever sleep with a woman and her granddaughter. Leviticus 18, 17. Let me read the whole verse. Do not have sexual relations with both a woman and her daughter. Do not have sexual relations with either her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter. They are her close relatives. That is weakness. Leviticus 20.14, if a man marries both a woman and her mother, it is wicked. Both he and they must be burned in the fire, so that no wickedness will be among you. God took this wickedness so seriously, he didn't even want these people to be given a decent funeral. He wanted the man who sleeps with a woman and her child, the three of them, to be burned alive. To be burned in the fire because he said this is weakness and if you don't burn them in fire there will be weakness in the land you see from a scientific point of view there's a genetic risk for a child born from two blood relatives especially diseases that are genetically transmitted that's why god was protecting us 
from genetic complications. God did not want close relatives to have sexual contact. So the first sin in the scriptures is incest. Sex sin number one, incest, any close relative. And I remind you, Leviticus 18.6, Leviticus 18.6, no one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. I am the Lord. So the first sex sin is incest. The second sex sin, sex sin number two, homosexuality or what we call gazing. Sex sin number two, homosexuality. We live in interesting times when people are debating whether we should uh, have man and man get married or woman and woman get married. This is an old sin. What is new right now is that we have priests who are gays. In ancient time, this was done by people who are deemed very wicked. What is strange with the day we are living, and this is evident, we are in the last days. Every time God finished a generation, it is because of gross sex sins. In Genesis 6, the first time God finished the entire race is when the sons of God had sexual relations with the daughters of men. And God finished an entire generation. He only preserved eight people, Noah and his wife. Noah's three sons and their wives. With eight people, God started a new race. Eight is the number of new beginnings. The New Testament was only written by eight men. Eight is the number of new beginnings. In Sodom and Gomorrah, God finished entire cities completely. He only saved Lot and his family because of sex sins. Sex sins make the whole land to vomit its inhabitants. And I'll be showing you that in scriptures. So what is strange with our day is that homosexuality is even among priests. There are churches today ordaining priests who are gays unheard of just 30 years ago. Unheard of. Homosexuality is old among sinners, but unheard of among the clergy. This is the last hour of the last day. So sex sin number two, homosexuality. I'll give you three scriptures from the Old Testament and two of them from the New Testament. And the reason I'll give you two from the New Testament is because we have people who say those laws were for Old Testament believers. The law of God stands all time. God's word is forever settled in heaven. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will by no means pass away. God says, there is no word I have spoken that will come back to me void. God's word is forever settled in heaven. What was seen in Genesis 1 is seen in Revelation 22. So let's look at scriptures that tell us about the sin of homosexuality. Leviticus 18.22. Leviticus 18.22. Do not practice homosexuality. Having sex with another man as with a woman, it is a detestable sin. Leviticus 20.13, Leviticus 20.13. If a man practices homosexuality, having sex with another man as with a woman, both men have committed a detestable act. They must be put to death for they are guilty of a capital offense. Scripture says homosexuality is a capital offense. In the old covenant, they were both put to death. Jude verse 7. Jude is in the New Testament. It's only one chapter. So I'm reading Jude verse 7. And don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. So God destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because of homosexuality. Every kind of sexual perversion happened in these cities. And he destroyed them by what? By fire. 
And Jude says, as a warning of the eternal fire awaiting homosexuals. So today you don't see the fire of God consuming a city because God is preserving the homosexuals for his judgment, the eternal fire, the lake of fire. Romans 1.27 explains what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. Romans 1.27 And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. What was the penalty? Fire. They died in fire. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. Sodomy is an English word for anosex. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor river, revilers. These are people who are used to reveries. Night clubbing, if you like. No revilers, no extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Sex sin number two, homosexuality. It is detestable. And those who do that will end up in the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. They will eternally be cast of God. Sex sin number three. Sex sin number three. Lesbianism. Lesbianism. Romans 1, 24 to 27. Romans 1, 24 to 27. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the Creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and in, instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having no more sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Paul, by revelation, in Romans 1, 24 to 27, explains how women slept with women and how men slept with men. And as a result, God burned the cities. It is strange. The angels of God went in there, destroyed everyone because of sexual perversion. 1 Timothy 1, 10 to 11. 1 Timothy 1, 10 to 11. The law is for people who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality. All are slave traders, liars, promise breakers, or who do anything else that contradicts the wholesome teaching that comes from the glorious good news entrusted to me by our blessed God. God is saying the reason we are reading this law, the reason I'm teaching you this message right now is not because of the righteous, but so that the evildoers may never have an excuse. Haven't you seen how lesbians and homosexualities want to charge you? Is it written that I should not practice lesbianism? So God is saying the reason the law was written is because of them. Listen at 1 Timothy 1.10 again. The law is for people who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality. Why? The righteous have the law of God in their hearts. The wicked have destroyed their conscience. Their conscience does not tell them when they are straying. They are dead to their conscience. They are dead in sin. That's why when you come to Christ, your conscience is alive. You become alive. When you're not in Christ, you're actually dead, lost in sin. 
You can do all sorts of sin without any guilt. But the righteous, there is something within you that will tell you this is wrong before God and this is right before God. But God decided to write the law so that the sinners will have no excuse. So that when God is executing his judgment, there will no one to say we were never warned, we were never told. So I am teaching this topic as a warning to our generation that is in lesbianism and homosexuality. God is watching you. And if you can hear my message, this is a warning from God through my lips. Turn away from your wickedness, repent your sins, and come to the bleeding side of Calvary. Jesus will forgive you all sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1.9 Come, come, come to Jesus. He will deliver you from the chains of lesbianism and homosexuality. You must never sleep with another man. A man must never sleep with another man. A woman must never have sex with another woman. This is detestable before God. This is a capital offense. Sex scene number four. Sex scene number four. Bestiality bestiality. I'll read for you some four passages of scriptures that speak against bestiality. What is bestiality? Having sex with an animal. Leviticus 18.23. Leviticus 18.23. Do not have sexual relations with an animal and defile yourself with it. A woman must not present herself to an animal to have sexual relations with it. That is perversion. Deuteronomy 27, 21. Cast is anyone who has sexual relations with any animal, any animal. Then all the people shall say, Amen. Exodus twenty two nineteen. Exodus twenty two nineteen. Whoever lies with an animal shall surely be put to death. Leviticus 20, 15 to 16. If a man has sex with an animal, he must be put to death and the animal must be killed. If a woman presents herself to a male animal to have intercourse with it, she and the animal must both be put to death. You must kill both for they are guilty of a capital offense. We, today we are living at a time when men are sleeping with dogs, having sex with dogs, when women are having sex with dogs, among other animals, and they keep them in their bedrooms and they are for their sexual relations. As a result of that, there are some viruses that have come to the human race. As a result of sleeping with dogs and monkeys and other primates, there are some diseases that have come to humanity because of our close relationship with animals. God says this is perversion. And in the old covenant, these people were both killed, both the people doing that and the animals. And God said they are guilty of a capital offense. Never, ever, ever have sex with an animal. If you do that, you will be a victim of God's judgment. This is detestable before God. It's a capital offense. Sex scene number five. Sex scene number five. Rape. R-A-P-E. Rape. Rape is having sex with someone without their consent. This is unbiblical. It's inhumane. It's cruel. And I'll give you some two passages of scripture. Again, it's rape. Deuteronomy 22, 25 to 26. Deuteronomy 22, 25 to 26. But if out of the country, a man happens to meet a young woman pledged to be married and rapes her, only the man who has done this shall die. Do nothing to the woman. She has committed no sin deserving death. This case is like that of someone who attacks and murders a neighbor. Here is the deal. Rape, as far as God is concerned, is as bad as murder. The victim of rape, scripture says, is like someone who is a victim of murder. 
So the rapist was treated like a murderer. He was killed in the old covenant. Deuteronomy 22, 23 to 24. Deuteronomy 22, 23 to 24. If a man happens to meet in a town a virgin pledged to be married and he sleeps with her, you shall take both of them to the gate of that town and stone them to death. The young woman, because she was in a town and did not scream for help, and the man, because he violated another man's wife, you must purge the evil from among you. Here is the deal. The Bible says if a young girl says she was raped, and this is a girl who was pledged to be married in the old covenant, they were both stoned to death. Why? If this girl was got into forced sex in town, or where there were people, she did not scream for help, then it is her fault. And you see from scriptures, from God's eyes, from the moment one is betrothed, pledged for marriage, from the moment a man proposes he's going to marry a girl, in God's eyes, they are as good as married. From God's eyes, if they have spoken it, they have made covenants, they have made commitments. God doesn't take words easily. He created everything through the spoken word. Jesus said, by your words you will be condemned, and by your words you shall be justified. When a man says to a woman, I will marry you, and she accepts, that is a covenant. And that's why the angel told Joseph, do not fear to take your wife Mary. They were not yet married, but they were betrothed. They had committed to marry. In God's eyes, they were already married. The moment a man speaks and the woman confirms and accepts, they have made an eternal covenant. Anything else is adultery. The God is being killed because of committing adultery. Why? Because God did not want people to take advantage of each other, have sex in consent, and then pretend later on they were forced into rape. So God was saying, if a man forces you into sex, scream immediately. I will amplify your voice. I will bring help. I am God Almighty. If you scream for help when somebody is holding you by force, I will ensure someone comes for your rescue. So this is what I'm telling you right now. Do not ever go through rape and be silenced by the one who violated your rights. You've got to scream immediately. Do whatever it takes to alert your neighbors. God will amplify your voice and will send someone for your rescue. And I'm saying this because many rape victims ended up committing suicide. The ones that don't commit suicide struggle with that memory imprinted in their minds. If you have gone through rape, I apologize. I'm sorry for what you've gone through. I'm sorry for that pain. Even scripture says, you are like a murder victim. But I want you to know this. While rape can leave you with a permanent scar, at least you're still alive. If you have gone through rape, you still can recover. Unlike a murder victim, a murder victim has no second chance. But if you've gone through rape, you still can recover. What you need to do, report immediately. Report immediately. And number two, See a therapist. See a therapist. Number three, and the most important, look for a pastor who knows the Lord. Look for a genuine man of God to pray with you, to be delivered from any territorial spirit that was haunting that man. Look for somebody who understands deliverance. Pray with them closely. You will be shielded and covered by the precious blood of the Son of God. Don't die alone. Don't keep quiet alone. Scream for help. Look for help. Don't go through rape, suffering through rape all by yourself. Sex scene number six. Sex scene number six. Prostitution. Prostitution. Now, a prostitute is any person who sells their body to those who have sold their morals, whether a man or a woman. Prostitution is that act of selling your body to people who have already sold their morals. James 1.15 James 1.15 says, 
Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. When you have subjected yourself to sexual immorality because of exposing yourself to pornographic materials, print or electronic, you are feeding your mind constantly with the wrong things. Then there will be a desire conceived within you to sin, a desire within you to engage in sex. And if that sex is not available for you, you will go and buy it. If you don't have it in the decent prescribed way in marriage, then you will try to procure a shortcut by procuring sex financially. You see, then that desire gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, it gives birth to death. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 3, 23. Now, Deuteronomy 23, 17 says, Deuteronomy 23, 17 says, no Israelite man or woman is to become a shrine prostitute. You see, in the ancient world, wild sexual orgies were done at a shrine before a pagan god. For example, in the festival of Isis of Egypt, in the festivals of Flora of, of Rome, in the festivals of Venus and Adonis among the Phoenicians, in the festivals of Baal, among the Jews. These are individuals who did rituals called shrine prostitutes. These individuals who did these rituals were called shrine prostitutes. Sometimes they were called court prostitutes, C-U-L-T, court prostitutes, or temple prostitutes. Sometimes they'll be running around the temple naked and do some of the most perverse things unthinkable among men in honor of their gods, their pagan gods. So God said in Deuteronomy 23, 17, Deuteronomy 23, 17, no Israelite or man is to become a shrine or cult or temple prostitute. Leviticus 19:29. Leviticus 19:29. Do not defile your daughter by making her a prostitute or the Lord will be filled with prostitution and wickedness. I have, I, have, I have seen women who literally take their girls for prostitution to earn money for them. I've had women who made those confessions to me. They are trying to use their girls to earn money through them. This is wickedness. You must never use your daughter or your son for prostitution to earn you money. This is serious wickedness. Leviticus 21.9, Leviticus 21.9. If a priest's daughter defiles herself by becoming a prostitute, she also defiles her father's holiness and she must be burned to death. Proverbs 23.27-28. For an adulterous woman, a prostitute if you don't mind, this text is talking about a prostitute. For an adulterous woman, it's a deep pit. And a wayward wife is a narrow well, like a bandit. She lies in wait and multiplies the unfaithful among men. A prostitute is a deep pit. You keep falling into it and you're not able to be rescued. You are bowed by that sin. It's a bondage, and you're not able to get out of that pit. Once you start, you have fallen in the pit. Getting out requires deliverance. A wayward wife may not be a prostitute. This is somebody's wife, but that's a narrow well. A narrow well, when you fall, you can't get out. You are dead. People used to use narrow wells to fetch water in traditional days. Like a bandit, like a robber, she lies in wait. A prostitute, the Bible equates her to a robber or a bandit. Why should you sell yourself to a robber? 1 Corinthians 6, 15 to 16. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 to 16. And this is a warning Paul is giving the church. This is for the believers, the blood-washed Christians. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that a 
that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her. For the scriptures say, the two are united into one. When you sleep together, a man and a woman, you become one flesh. When you sleep together, you become one flesh. You are united. When you came to Christ, you got married to Christ. You are part of the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ has all members, all parts of her body. You could be a finger, you could be a nose, you could be an ear, but you are a member of that beautiful virgin of Christ, the bride. So don't unite a member of Christ with a prostitute. When you sleep with a prostitute, you are uniting Christ with a prostitute. Because whoever sleeps with a woman becomes one with her. Christ is married to his bride, Ecclesia, the church. Don't unite the church and by extension Christ with prostitution. That's what Paul is saying. Now, Proverbs 5, 3 to 11. Proverbs 5, 3 to 11. For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as girl, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths wander aimlessly, but she does not know it. But she does not know it. She does not know it. A prostitute does not know what she's doing. She wanders aimlessly without thinking about the way of life, the purpose of life, the meaning of life, the significance of life. Verse 7 says, Now then, my sons. This is an instruction because this is an instruction from the wisest man that ever lived. You've got to be careful when you're working with someone who has no purpose for living, someone who has no meaning of life, does not even know the reason for her existence. Verse 7, Proverbs 5, now verse 7, Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house lest you lose your honor to others and your dignity to one who is cruel, lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich the house of another. At the end of your life you will groan when your flesh and body are spent. Here is the word of God from King Solomon. Son, don't go to the house of the prostitute. Even if it's so organized, so modern, so civil, if you may, in the name of brothel, whatever name they give it, don't go near her house. These days they have many names. They are called call girls, sex workers. We don't want to call them by their right name. They are prostitutes. They are prostitutes. That's the word used in the scriptures. We are trying to Christianize terms so that they don't look sinful. We want prostitution to look like any other career. Some governments, like the Netherlands, even collect taxes from prostitution. The Bible wants any pastor who collects tithes and offerings from prostitution. Money collected in prostitution must never go to the house of God. The Bible wants again is that. So the Bible says, don't ever go to a house. Don't ever go to that brothel. This is selling your flesh. It means what? You will lose your honor. You will lose your dignity. You will lose your reputation. You will lose your money. You will lose your strength to another person. Someone who does not even care about you. Don't even go near a house. Don't make a decision when you're there. Make a decision long before. Right at her doorstep, it is hard to make the right decision. Do not go near the door of her house, the Bible says. If you do that, you will die poor and weak. Your body will waste away. Your reputation, your dignity, protect yourself. Don't go near her house. Sex scene number seven. Sex scene number seven, adultery, adultery. 
Exodus 20 verse 14. Exodus 20 verse 14. You must not commit adultery. Deuteronomy 5.18. Deuteronomy 5.18. You must not commit adultery. Leviticus 18.20. Do not defile yourself by having sexual intercourse with your neighbor's wife. Leviticus 20.10. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. Deuteronomy 22, 22 to 24. If a man is discovered committing adultery, both he and the woman must die. In the same way, you will purge Israel of such evil. Suppose a man meets a young woman a virgin who is engaged to be married, and he has sexual intercourse with her. If this happens within a town, you must take both of them to the gates of that town and stone them to death. The woman is guilty because she did not scream for help. The man must die because he violated another man's wife. In this way, you will purge this evil from among you. The Bible says if a man sleeps with a girl who is already betrothed, who is already committed, who is already engaged, proposed, is as good as sleeping with another man's wife. This will be treated as adultery and they must be put to death. In the Old Covenant, God took adultery so serious. It was one of the Ten Commandments. And both, the, both of them were stoned to death. Proverbs 6.32, Proverbs 6.32 I'll read from the English Standard Version. From the English Standard Version. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. The New Living Translation. The New Living Translation. Proverbs 6, 32. But the man who commits adultery is an utter fool. For he destroys himself. What's the Bible saying? Sleeping with another man's wife is foolishness. It's lack of sense. That man can kill you, even if you're stronger than him, wealthier than him, more influential than him. He can hire even goons to murder you. Don't underestimate the rage of a man when you sleep with his wife. Sleeping with another man's wife is foolishness, is lack of sense. Sex scene number seven is adultery. Sex scene number eight, fornication. Fornication. And fornication is any sex that involved someone who is not married, whether the person sleeps with another unmarried one or with a married person. To the unmarried, that is fornication. To the unmarried, that is fornication. That includes mistresses. For the man who has a mistress, to that man, it's adultery. The mistress, that's fornication. That's fornication. I have, I have a few scriptures, a couple of scriptures that speak against fornication. Let me give you a couple of them. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 21. All the scriptures I will read about fornication are from the King James Version. From the King James Version. Second Corinthians 12, 21. Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before, and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they have practiced. Matthew fifteen nineteen, Matthew fifteen nineteen. These are the words directly from the lips of the Master. Jesus said, "For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies." 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. 
Eventually, fornicators will be treated equally with drunkards, with the covetous, with the thieves, with the murderers, extortioners, those who extortion money from others. Galatians 5.19 Galatians 5.19 Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness. All the people who practice such things shall never inherit the kingdom of God. None of these people shall inherit the kingdom of God. Ephesians 5, 3 to 5. Ephesians 5, 3 to 5. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you, let it not be mentioned among you, as become saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, no unclean person, no covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. First Thessalonians 4, 3 to 4. First Thessalonians 4, 3 to 4. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that he should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Hold your organs, the members of your body, your sexual organs, that's what the Bible calls your, your vessel. Hold your vessel in sanctification and honor. What that means is sleeping around is dishonoring yourself. You are a woman of honor when you have value. You're not easily available for anyone. You're not all things to all people. You hold yourself with dignity, with esteem, with honor. If you're available for every Tom, Dick, and Harry, you have compromised your dignity. You've compromised your honor. It's an honor to be chaste. It's an honor to be clean. It's to your honor and to the honor of God. Save sex. No safe sex outside marriage. One more time. Save sex. No safe sex outside marriage. All singles who can hear my voice, save sex for marriage. No safe sex outside marriage. So safe sex, no safe sex outside marriage. Some people write to me and ask me about sex toys, masturbation, professional cuddling, watching pornography, a lot of stuff. I want to tell you this. We are living at a time when people are discovering more and more sin. Here is a deal. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, 1 Thessalonians 5.22, in the New King James Version, abstain from every form of evil. In the New Living Translation, stay away from every kind of evil. Stay away from every kind of evil. When you are in Christ, your conscience is alive. You are able to tell what is good and what is bad, what is clean and what is dirty, what is holy and what is sinful, what is right and what is wrong. You can draw a line between good and evil because you are in Christ. And that's why scripture says in the new covenant, I will write my laws in their hearts. They will not need to go to a temple somewhere to ask where is the law of God. And that's the question Jesus was asking. We shall no longer say the new covenant. Who will go to heaven to know what is the will of God? Why? Because that will of God is written in our hearts. Titus 2, 11 and 12. Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. In this present age of lawlessness, sin has increased exponentially. In this age when we are doing sin with no shame, just a few years ago, a woman's virginity was her dignity. A woman couldn't sleep around before she was married. 
It was taken as a disgrace to her father and her family. Today she is proud to brag how she's sleeping around. She's even proud to say how she's sleeping another man's with another woman's husband. They even sit down together as girls to strategize how to get somebody else's husband because he's an MP, he's a congressman, he's a governor, he's a CEO. The strategy is how to bring down the mighty. What a shame today that men can come together and strategize how to get a woman who is married or single. We have even senior government officials who contract people to procure for them prostitutes and call girls to organize these dates for them. What a day we are living. But in this present age, scripture says, the grace of God will teach the godly how to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Christ in me, the hope of glory, the hope of glory, the hope of glory. That grace of God in me teaches me to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. I can tell sin from a distance. I can know sin at its appearance because of the grace of God. Now, sexuality, sexual immorality, sexual immorality defiles the land. Right now, we are discussing about COVID-19 that has swept the entire world, a pandemic unseen in modern history. This is an infamy for generations in the Lord Jesus tarries. And we are wondering where this pandemic has come from. Let me show you something from scriptures. Leviticus 18 24 to 28. And the reason I'm saying this, everywhere we saw God wipe out a generation, it was because of gross sexual immorality. Leviticus 18, 24 to 28. Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, because this is how the nations that I'm going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled. So I punished it for its sin. And the Lord vomited out its inhabitants. But you must keep my decrees and my laws. The native born and the foreigners residing among you must not do any of these detestable things. For all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. Now, the entire Leviticus 18 describes sexual sins, all the way from verse 1 to verse 23. And then the conclusion of that chapter, verse 24 to 28 says, because of these sexual sins, the Lord was defiled, and it vomited out these people because of sexual perversion. Now, God was telling the Israelites, now I am giving you this land, the Lord has vomited out its inhabitants because they defiled the Lord through sexual immorality. Don't do these things because if you do these things they did, you too will be defiled by the Lord. What does God say? Number one, do not be involved in incest. That is sex sin number one. Number two, do not be involved in homosexuality. Number three, don't be involved in lesbianism. Number four, don't ever be involved in bestiality. You must never have sex with an animal. Number five, you must never rape anyone. Never have sex with anyone without their consent. Number six, don't be involved in prostitution. Don't buy sex. That is reducing yourself to a loaf of bread, the Bible says. Number seven, do not commit adultery. Number eight, do not fornicate. That's exactly the sin that defiled the land. Revelation 21 verse eight. Revelation 21 verse eight. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic acts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Scripture says all the eight categories I described, 
this people will go to the lake of fire burning sulfur sulfur burns at 2000 degrees celsius this is the second death a fire that will never be quenched this is to be eternally cast by god what can you do to avoid sexual immorality what do we do to avoid the trap of sexual sins i want to give you five things you can do to avoid sexual sins number one flee sexual immorality flee sexual immorality don't put yourself in situations meet in the public with anyone who is not your wife with anyone who is not your husband public means where other people are people of the right conscience people with the right values meet in a restaurant meet in shopping malls meet in the parks meet in the open anything that is done in secret in darkness one day shall be revealed jesus said first corinthians 6 18 to 19 first corinthians 6 18 to 19 flee from sexual immorality all other sins a person commits are outside the body but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body do you not know that your bodies are temples of the holy spirit who is in you whom you have received from god your body is the temple of the holy one of jacob preserve it how by fleeing from sexual immorality do not put yourself in situations do like joseph who ran away leaving his jacket behind an expensive jacket he left it behind because he knew at some point if he continues to wash the bedroom of Potiphar and the wife is pushing for sex, eventually he might feel the warmth of this beautiful woman and sin against God and sin against Potiphar and his wife. And he knew the wages of sin is death. If he gets into that trap, it will be worse for him. So he decided to leave that house and I believe he never returned to that house. And that's why this woman, because she didn't know how to behave, had to accuse Joseph falsely of rape. He was taken to prison because of a false accusation of attempted rape. This is what we call suffering for the gospel, suffering for righteousness. Because if you suffer for righteousness, right in your prison cell, God will trace you and promote you to places you never thought before. Just as he picked Joseph from the dungeons of prison to be the prime minister, the second in command in Egypt. If you stand for the right thing, no matter who laughs at you, no matter who ridicules you, no matter who mocks you, how can you be a virgin girl in this time and age? How come you've never slept with a girl? Some boys smoke others. Let me tell you this. God will pick you up and will bless you in the public. He will bless you publicly. When you stand for Christ, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to the fiery furnace. They refused to bow down to the king and his image. God blessed them publicly. God blessed Daniel. He suffered for a while thrown in the den of hungry lions miraculously god blocked their mouths they were so friendly they were a pillow a mattress for daniel and daniel got a promotion but even if you don't get a promotion jesus said they that endure to the end shall be saved because to be absent in the body is to be present with the lord even if you die for the faith like stephen in Acts 7, like all the apostles of Jesus Christ, with the exception of John, whom tradition tells us they tried to burn with oil, but he couldn't die. One by one, they died for what they believed. Today, they are with Christ in glory. If we suffer with Christ, we shall reign with Christ. If we die with Christ, we shall live with Christ. If we remain faithful, he will remain faithful. If we remain faithless and we lose faith, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Be faithful, like Moses was faithful, in all of God's house. Be faithful, 
as Jesus was faithful. Be faithful in this present age. Be the remnant of God. God has a remnant and you are God's remnant. You are God's voice in that office to speak against sexual affairs. You are God's voice in your family. You are God's voice in your community. You are God's voice in your nation. Stand up against homosexuality. Speak up against lesbianism. Speak up against incest. God is looking for a people who stand for righteousness in these last days. Jesus is about to come. I can hear the footsteps of the Messiah. Jesus is looking for a people who will be rescued like the days of Noah. Only eight men, eight people, only four men, four women. Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives were rescued. Let me tell you, that's a very insignificant percentage that was saved during the time of the flood. As this family was lifted high by the floods, Jesus is lifting high his church in the rapture. Jesus is raising his church in the rapture. Many will miss out this way. Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to life and broad is the way that leads to death. Be the remnant of God. Speak up for Jesus. You are Christ's ambassador. You are his voice. You are his message. And soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. He's coming for a holy church. He's coming for a righteous church. I don't know about you, but I've made up my mind. I'll walk that extra mile. I'll be counted worthy and faithful. I'll be counted among the remnants of God. So one thing, flee. Do it the old traditional way. Stop going to that man's house. Stop going to that woman's house. Do it the Joseph way. Don't negotiate with a sinner. Run away. Flee. Number two, control what you watch. I'm telling you five things. Number one, to avoid sexual sins, flee from sexual immorality. Number two, control what you watch. The eyes are the windows of the soul. And the ears are the gateway to the heart. You are a product of what you consume. With your eyes and with your ears, they feed your subconscious mind. The main sex organ is not your penis, not your vagina, and not your breasts, and not your butts. The main sex organ is the mind. Affairs don't start on the bed. Affairs start in the mind. You play the picture so, so well, and then the body goes to complete the mental picture. That's why Jesus said, whoever looks at a woman lustfully, has already committed adultery. You've already done it in your mind. It's a question of, is she available to complete the act? Job 31 verse 1. Job 31 verse 1. I, have, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. No wonder God gave a testimony about Job. This is amazing that uh, the holy God, the mighty God of Israel, almighty God, most holy God, the only true God, the Father of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, give a testimony about Job. He said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the whole world, righteous in all his ways. Here is the reason. Job decided not to sin in his heart. Leave alone sinning physically. He said, I have made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Stop watching pornographic magazines. Stop watching pornographic videos. Stop watching provocative materials. Everything you watch, you eventually want to do. There are some Christians who say there is some good pornography for Christian couples. What a lying devil! Why are you buying demonic stuff? There's no such a thing as clean pornography. There's no such a thing as clean pornography. If you're a Christian couple listening to me who live by the Spirit of God, God's Spirit will let you know this is evil. If your conscience is alive, would you invite Jesus to watch that video with you? Just ask yourself that simple question. 
Would you invite Jesus in the bedroom to watch that video with you? How clean are the people who are producing that video? What was their intent? What was their objective? Why do you want to watch a diabolic movie anointed by Satan? Make a covenant with your eyes not to watch unclean stuff. Number three, to keep yourself from sexual promiscuity, sexual impurity. Number three, meditate on God's word. Meditate on God's word. Psalms 119.11. Psalms 119.11. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The psalmist said, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Thy word is my compass, my guiding spirit. I meditate on your word day and night that I may not sin against you. Because when the word of God is a life in you, you will not sin again is the Lord. Jesus is the word of God. If Jesus is truly born in you, you meditate on Jesus, the living word of God. For in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John 1.1 1, 1. Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And the first thing God spoke in Genesis 1-3, he spoke Jesus on this planet. He said, let there be light. Let the Son of God come down. The sun, the moon, the stars were created much later on the fourth day. But on the very first day, God first spoke the Son of God. He first spoke Jesus to come here. And centuries later, Jesus confirmed, I am the light of the world. When this present earth and heaven pass away, in the new heaven, in the new earth, there will be no sun, no moon, no stars. Why? The Lamb of God will be the Lamb of the city. Oh, hallelujah. The Lamb of God will be the light of the new Jerusalem, the new city of God, the new heaven, the new earth. When Jesus is alive in you, how? By meditating on him, meditating on his word, you will not sin against God. Number four, what do we do? Be led of the Holy Spirit. Be led of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.16 So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you, you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Our sinful nature craves for sin. When we are led by the Holy Spirit, we do not satisfy the cravings of the sinful nature. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Our sinful nature is at war with the will of God. There is a war between what we want to do and what our body wants to do. And the only way to defeat the body is to walk in the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The temptations in your life are not different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you can endure. Scripture is saying there is nothing new under the sun as it is written in Ecclesiastes. Now here in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul is saying, there's no temptation you're going through that others don't experience. Those who overcame sin and Satan had the same temptation, the same body, the same blood. The same, same sins have been on earth since man came into being. Don't give an excuse about your time because in any generation there is a remnant. There are other people who are single like you, but they are victorious. Who are married like you, but living a clean life. You don't have to live in affairs. You don't have to live in affairs. Walk in the Spirit of God, and you shall do what is pleasing to God. You shall know what is the perfect will of God. What do we do? Number five, for the singles, get married. It sounds funny, but I'm serious. 1 Corinthians 7.2 1 Corinthians 7.2 
But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. 1 Corinthians 7, 8 to 9. 1 Corinthians 7, 8 to 9. Now to the unmarried and the widows I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried, as I do, but if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now let me say this. Make no mistake. Marriage does not solve lust. No. Perhaps there are more married people who are in lust than those who are single. Marriage is not a solution to lust. Marriage is not a solution to sin. No, 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 no. But the truth is, there are many single people who keep on wishing they had their own husband, who keep on wishing they had their own wife. They are believers. They are born again Christians. They love the Lord Jesus. But they are living in strain. They want to be caressed. They want to be kissed. They want their hands to be held. They want to share intimate moments with someone. They want to have intimate relationship with someone. They are burning with passion more than they would care to admit. They are worship leaders. They may be preachers. They may be good brothers who support ministers in their giving. They are good people, but within them they die with passion. They just want someone to share love with them. If that describes you, then the Bible says, get married. It is better to marry than to burn with passion. Because sometimes when you burn with passion, you cross the line of sin. Because you start admiring someone sexually, and that one, Jesus called it sin. And now you may tell me, preacher, you are telling me to get married. I have not refused to get married. What are you telling me? Hear me. If that describes you, here is my word for you. Live your life to the full right now. Don't live ex waiting for someone who did not give you an appointment. In God's own timing, that man is coming your way. Trust me, for God makes all things beautiful in its time. Enjoy your singleness now. God makes singleness and singlehood beautiful when you're going through it. He gives you the grace to handle singleness. And when you get married, he gives you the grace to handle your marriage. Enjoy your life now. You are a hundred percent complete. There's nothing like a better half. No, someone else may compliment you, but they never come to complete you. You are complete. That's why scripture says we are joint heirs with Christ. We are not equal heirs. Equal heirs means I own 50%, he owns 50%. In the American law and many other nations around the world, when people divorce, the married couple goes 50-50 of all the property they had. That's the law of this world, 50-50. God's law is joint heirs. That means the husband and the wife own everything jointly, 100%. Because God's match does not include divorce. We are joint heirs with Christ. We don't own 50-50. Everything I have belongs to Christ. Everything Christ has belongs to me. We are joint heirs. We own everything 100%. 100% of what Christ has is mine. 100% of what I have is Christ. That's the same way a couple lives in marriage. 100%. 100%. So you are 100% complete. Then you meet another man who is 100% complete. And the two of you become 100% complete. Just like Jesus is complete on his own. The Father is complete on his own. The Holy Spirit is complete on his own. The three persons in the triune God make a complete whole. Not three persons. Not, not three God, sorry. Not three, but one whole. This is a mystery, but that's what God intended. For married people, they own everything jointly. There's no her money, my money. Her house, my house. There's nothing like her car, my car. Her mother, my mother. No, it's our mother, our car, our house, our money, our children, our property. My mercy and I own everything jointly, 100%. 
we are not equal heirs. We don't own 50-50. We are joint heirs. Joint heirs. We jointly own together. Because our marriage was made in heaven. To stay till the Lord takes us home. What am I telling you singles? Be you are 100% complete. No one can live along with others until they learn how to live with themselves. No one can get along with others until they learn how to get along with themselves. So enjoy your best life now and enjoy when a man comes. Enjoy when you get a woman. Whoever gets a wife gets favor of the Lord. And when Jesus returns, we shall enjoy eternity together. But enjoy what God has given you right now. Don't wait until you become rich to enjoy your life. For contentment with godliness is a great gain. 1 Timothy 6.6 6. 1 Timothy 6.6 6. Contentment with godliness is a great gain. Enjoy what you have now. Enjoy when God gives you more. Enjoy your singleness now. And if you're married, enjoy your marriage life now. And I want to pray for you right now that you may live a victorious life in Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every brother, every sister watching me. I bless them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray, Almighty God, as many as are bowed by sexual immorality, deliver them right now. In Jesus' name, deliver them right now. In Jesus' name, set them free from prostitution. Set them free from adultery. Set them free from fornication. Set them free from lesbianism. Set them free from homosexuality. Set them free from incest. Set them free above Father. Let them walk in the freedom and in the liberty that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I pray in Jesus' name, those who don't know you as Lord and Savior, save them right now. Let them hear your voice and give their lives to Jesus. Those who know you as Lord and Savior, preserve them, Lord, to stay clean. Keep them clean, O oh God. I pray none of them will be lost. When Jesus returns, we shall celebrate in glory. For all the marriages presented here, I bless the marriages. For that wayward wife, may you rescue her, O God. May you put sense in her head that she may stop cheating her husband, that she may even stop emotional affairs. I pray, Almighty God, that she may live a clean life, honorable life. Let her honor her husband, honor her marriage, honor her family in the name of Jesus. God, I pray for this man who has been cheating on his wife, having extramarital affairs. I call him back to his senses. I call him back home. I pray, Almighty God, destroy the desire to sin. I pray, Almighty God, put sense in his mind. Let him value his wife, his family, his children. Oh, God Almighty, have mercy on him. Give him wisdom, wisdom that comes from God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I thank you for the young man who is watching me right now and he is single. Bless him with his own wife. Let him relate with his girlfriend in the right way, in dignity. Oh God, until he takes this girl into church and they wed and they live a righteous marital life. I thank you for the single girl watching me. I pray that you may bless her with her husband in the name of Jesus. I pray that this girl will not move with anybody's husband. She will live a clean life in the name of Jesus. Oh God, for this one has been lost as a mistress. I pray that she may realize that she deserves her own husband. I pray that you may open the understanding of her heart, the eyes of her understanding, that she doesn't deserve to take the leftovers. She deserves the very best, for Jesus came, that we may have life and have it more abundantly. John 10.10 10. May this woman know that truth, and may she trust you, O oh God, for her own husband, in the name of Jesus. 
in the name of Jesus. Deliver this man from homosexuality. Destroy the desire for homosexuality. Deliver this woman from lesbianism in the name of Jesus. I pray God for this man who is sleeping around with his wife's sister. Stop it in the name of Jesus. For this woman who is sleeping in the, with a the brother-in-law. Stop it in the name of Jesus. Stop sleeping with your cousin. In Jesus' name, God is giving you a new beginning. Stop sleeping around with your aunt and your uncle. In the name of Jesus, God is giving you a new beginning. God is giving you a new beginning. Stop sleeping with your nephew. Stop sleeping with your niece. God is giving you a new beginning. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's children say, Amen and Amen and Amen. If you want to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, please, please write to me as a comment in this video and I'll reach out to you. Write to me as a comment in this video. I'll reach out to you. The Lord wants to save you. The Lord wants you to have life here and life thereafter. For you shall know the truth. The truth is Jesus and that truth will set you free. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord forgive your sins. May the Lord prosper you in every good way. In Jesus' name I bless you. Amen and amen. Shalom.